Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us, to, joining with us today. Uh, while we wait for other students to join in, let me introduce myself. I'm Sheila Tiagraj, Director, Gen Next Education, based out of the Bangalore office. And joining me here today are my colleagues, Mr. Ben Martin from our Canada office and Ms. Suman from our Bangalore office. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce to the panel and all of the attendees here, the person who is responsible for making this webinar happen today, Mr. Sanjeev Sani, Director, Office of International Affairs, Chitkara University. Thank you very much, Sanjeev and team, for providing us this opportunity and in organizing this session for your students. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with Gen Next Education, who we are and what we do. But for those of you who'd like to know a bit more about Gen Next Education, we are an organization committed to providing students with clear, reliable, and com comprehensive information regarding overseas education options. We also evince keen interest in internationalizing Indian and foreign institutions through mutually beneficial initiatives. In short, we are a single window operation to facilitate global educational opportunities and partner with universities across the globe, collaborating with colleges across India and the Middle East, inspiring students to become future ready. So with that, for those of you who would like to connect with us, we will provide you with our contact details towards the end of this webinar so you can reach out to us. Um, so with that, let me introduce the panelists on today's webinar. On today's panel, we have guests from University of St. Thomas. Uh, we have Dr. John Abraham, uh, Program Director, Mechanical Engineering, University of St. Thomas, who will give you an overview of the program, the kind of projects and research work happening in the department and general coursework and opportunities. We also have Dr. Babani Misra, Associate Dean of Graduate School of Engineering. I know most of you attending this webinar must have met uh, Dr. Babani when he visited your campus. So he will be addressing admission related and general queries and any questions you have about the university or other programs in general. And most interesting element in this webinar is that we have a current student, uh, Mr. Sandeep on the panel. So Sandeep is a current mechanical engineering student entering his final semester who will be sharing his valuable experiences as a student. I extend a warm welcome to all of the panelists and we're very happy to have all of you with us here today. So before we get started, uh, let me quickly go over a few housekeeping points. Uh, keep your microphone muted at all times during the length of the webinar and type out your questions uh, in the Q&A box provided and not in the chat box. We will make sure all of your questions are addressed. Without any further delay, uh, over to you, Dr. Babani. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for everybody making this happen. And uh, we will get started. We'll start uh, the way we have structured this. We'll start talking about a little bit introduction about our university, who we are, where we are, and what we do, what we offer, specifically in School of Engineering graduate programs. And then we will specifically um, listen to Dr. Abraham about his research and mechanical engineering program in our university. And after that, we'll go back to talk about why people come to our university, what are the things as an international student one has to think about and look into before making up mind to where to go, what to study. And those are the key things we will discuss, followed by experience, which will be shared by Sandeep Ganeshan. And then we will open up for question and answer. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And that is how we have structured it. To get started, as you can see, a beautiful picture of our campus uh, right now. And please note, there is a URL mentioned, stthomas.edu slash engineering. Uh, one way of getting hold of us or knowing anything about our engineering school and specifically our graduate programs, this is the place to get started. Many times during my travel to um, India, people wonder where Minneapolis and where St. Paul is. We are actually on the middle of the country in the north side, as you can see in the map. Um, that is where we are located. And nor to north of us, our state is Canada. And the Minneapolis-St. Paul 
is not a small place. It's a quite a large city. It's the 14th largest metropolitan area and has been ranked as one of the best place to live. And we can vouch for it because we have been living for over 30 years here. So besides that, um, the main thing is it is home to the fastest growing technical com technology community. And why it is important? Because as a mechanical engineering student or any engineering student for that matter, it is important that you select a place of study where you can connect with the local industry quickly and have access to the local industry uh, by way of internship, by way of working. So that's what is one of the major advantages of this particular city where we have 27 companies uh, out of 5,000. We have 17 Fortune 500 companies within 15 minutes from the campus. We have many startup companies. So uh, then a little bit about, that's about the place. And um, next is about our university. This university was founded in 1885. That means 135 years back, this came into existence. And today it is the largest private university. And that, that's what we call largest independent university. It has eight different colleges, arts and science, health, business, education, divinity, social work, law, and engineering. And that is where we belong to the School of Engineering. We have 92 undergraduate majors, 46 graduate programs. Almost 40% of our 11,000 students are in the graduate program. Almost 900 of those are in the School of Engineering itself. We have campus on both sides of Mississippi River. The Mississippi River flows through the, um, between St. Paul and Minneapolis, and we are on the bank of the Mississippi River in the St. Paul campus. So these are some of the pictures of our campus, just to give an idea what it looks like, and you can see the Mississippi River passing by there. This is what is our engineering school looks like. And this is our Minneapolis campus where we have law, business, and education programs. We are out of close to actually 3,500, I would say close to 4,000 universities and institutions exist in the United States. We are ranked uh, 139. Our College of Business is also ranked on the top 25, and School of Engineering um, ranked 38. Just to give you an idea, we are a reputed university and have contributed to uh, the education for a long time. Here is a little bit about the School of Engineering. School of Engineering has about 1,600 students, out of which close to 900 are in the um, graduate programs graduate in, um, in Indian terms, postgraduate programs, because it, you know, we call a United States uh, master's program or PhD programs are called graduate, which is termed in an Indian term is postgraduate. So that's what we mean. When we say graduate, we mean postgraduate. <clears throat> the number of degrees in the master's program in School of Engineering, as you can see, the four in the area of software and data science, and then we have six in the area of engineering, electrical, mechanical, manufacturing systems, technology management, and regulatory science. We have undergraduate <clears throat> bachelor's degree in four different areas, civil, electrical, mechanical, and computer engineering. So this gives you an overall picture of <clears throat> our uh, school of engineering as a whole. The, as I said, we have about approximately 900 students in the graduate programs, about 700 students in our undergraduate program. These are the engineering programs that we offer. And as you can see, in each of those, we have how long, um, uh, how many courses are required for each of these programs. Most of them are 30 credits, 30 semester credits, or 10 courses. Each of our course is three credit long. Um, the technology management and regulatory science has little longer, 36 and 33 credits, or 11 courses, 10 and 11 courses. Our software and data science program, which has the, one of the largest uh, enrollments on data science is above more than 300 in, uh, students pursuing that. Software engineering, over 150 students, and so on. So those are also part of School of Engineering. And each of these courses, each of these programs require 12 courses or 36 semester credits. 
In addition to master's degree, we have something called graduate certificates. Uh, you can think of graduate certificates similar to, in India, we call it postgraduate diploma. You know, after you finish your undergraduate, you go for a year of study and then you get a postgraduate diploma. There is nothing like that in the United States. The closest that I can think of is a graduate certificate. Like, for example, if you are thinking of, let's say, I can use the first one, artificial intelligence graduate certificate. It requires five courses, five graduate courses. Students can get MS as well as the graduate certificate because this graduate certificate courses are part of MS curriculum as well. So similarly, one can have a manufacturing systems or a technology leadership, power electronics. So those are, well, there are two things because of this sometimes some individuals do not need to go through the entire master's program, specifically those who are working and trying to get knowledge in a specific field. Plus, it also, those who are in the master's program, it helps them to show as a specialization. So with that, we have each of our engineering programs is headed by the program directors. And Dr. John Abraham is with us from the mechanical engineering. And I will I would request John uh, for next several slides, which John will speak to about the various things we do and examples of what we do and how we are collaborating with industry as well as pursuing our research. John, you can go ahead and I will put the slide. Thank you, Dr. Misra. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today speaking with you. Uh, and on the prior slide, you saw my email address. If there are follow-up questions that people have, and we can hold right there, Babani. If there are yeah. follow-up questions people have, you feel free to email me. Um, I wanna mention two things about uh, Minnesota, and Sandeep will also talk about them, but we, uh, we're a really unique part of the country, uh, the United States. Uh, we get cold in the winter and we have snow. And I have to tell you, it is such a pleasure to be able to walk outside and actually see frozen water falling from the sky. And depending on where you are in India, you may have never experienced snow. It's a real treasure. And it's something that we really like. In fact, and Sandeep, I don't know if you've done this, but in the winter, our lakes freeze over and you can ice fish. That means you stand on a lake you drill a hole in the ice and you catch fish through the hole. Uh, now, Minnesota has 17,000 lakes. Our state has 17,000 lakes. So we have great opportunities for people to get outside and enjoy the outsides. It's warm in the summer. It's beautiful in the spring and fall. It's beautiful in the winter with cold. We have great food, a very, very diverse um, uh, population, people from all over the world, and we treasure and cherish the diversity that we have in Minnesota. So with that, what I wanna talk about is one of the distinguishing features of St. Thomas with respect to engineering. We are an applied school. Now, what does that mean? It means that we wanna teach you skills that you can use right away to in your careers, to advance your careers, to get new jobs, to invent new things, and to become a successful engineer. So we will teach you theory, we will teach you fundamentals, but we will also teach you applications. And our applications are driven by companies. And as Dr. Misra mentioned, we have companies uh, from around the world in Minnesota Many of the industries include medical, energy, manufacturing, transportation. We have many, many companies, a very, very healthy economy. I'm, and what I'm gonna do here is give some examples of some of the research that I've carried out with companies. And this will give you an insight of what our faculty are working on and what our students are working on. The first example that I'm gonna give is on implantable medical devices. Now, many times people, patients have devices implanted into their body to treat various health problems like heart disease, arrhythmia, uh, sometimes chronic pain or par paralysis. 
We can implant medical devices that provide treatments. And I'm showing you a photograph of three devices uh, from three different companies, and they're all used to treat chronic pain so that people don't have to take uh, addictive medication. These devices are from the very large companies, Medtronic, St. Jude Medical, and Boston Scientific. And you see these devices, they're implanted in the top row. Those are put into the skin, underneath the skin, and the devices in the bottom image are placed outside the skin, and they recharge. So if you imagine a smartphone, I'm holding a smartphone. If I want to recharge the battery of the smartphone, I'll plug it in. And you'll notice the smartphone becomes hot. And these companies have these devices that become hot when they're recharged. The problem is that can cause burning of tissue, burning of muscle and skin. And that's a big health risk to the companies. So I was asked uh, by these companies to help make sure their devices can recharge safely. Now these devices don't use a wire to plug in, like a smartphone might use a wire. Rather, they use something called induction charging. And some of you might have induction pads that you can put your smartphone on and they'll charge wirelessly, but it's wireless charging. But even if you use wireless charging, these devices can become hot and that's a health risk for patients. So Bhavani, you can go to the next slide or you can advance. So I was asked to help those companies recharge their devices without burning tissue. Another example that I was involved with is wind power. Wind power is growing around the world and especially it's growing in both the developed and developing worlds. Now, I was asked to work on a wind, uh, we'll go back, Babani, go to that first photo. I was asked to help invent a wind turbine that can power cell towers. As you know, if you're using a cell phone anywhere in the world, you're communicating with cellular equipment and they are often on cell towers. Those cell equipment, that cell equipment needs power. How do you get power to the cell equipment? You generally connect them to a municipal power grid, coal plant, hydropower, nuclear power, or so forth. But sometimes the power goes down and you have a brownout or a blackout, and then the cell equipment doesn't work and all of the communication in the region will go down. So we were asked to develop a wind turbine to power cell equipment. Most wind turbines are like propellers. They go around and around in a circle like airplane propellers. That won't work in a cell tower because the uh, tower is sitting next to the wind turbine and the blades will hit the tower. So we developed a vertical axis wind turbine. The image that you see on the left is an actual wind turbine installed along a cell tower and it spins, it spins like this. And it generates power. This is one that's actually installed. And in fact, this is installed in Minnesota. And if you look out in the distance, this was done in December. You can see some snow on the ground in Minnesota. So I wasn't lying about snow. Babani, could you go to the next image? These are two images of, the device, of a new device being installed. On the left-hand side, you see a crane lifting the device up. And on the right side, you see a, a version of our wind turbine. And it's got uh, two sets of blades to it. So there's two rotating blades that are connected. So this is an ex a second example. And I'm getting a little feedback, so I, I, I think that's over. This is a second example of a corporate project. This is actually an investor who came to us and asked us to help invent this thing. Babani, could you go to the next slide? I'm going to show you a series. Actually, go back one image. These are the manufacturing plants. And actually, this is being manufactured in India and they're being sold in Iraq and Jordan. So here is a manufacturing plant of our wind turbine. Here's one image. Babani will go to the next image and the last image. So these are pictures of our manufacturing plant. I'm going to give a few more examples. 
we'll go to the next slide. And let's go ahead. Uh, one major, major health risk is cardiac disease. That's where your heart dies because the arteries get clogged. They get clogged because of what's called cholesterol or fatty deposits on the inside of an artery, just like a water pipe can get clogged. And when a water pipe gets clogged, water can't go through it. The same thing is true with an artery. So I worked with a company that developed a device to help regrow heart tissue. If you have a heart attack, your heart, part of your heart can die and then it can't pump. So we want to regrow the tissue. And the way it's regrown is stem cells are injected into the heart. And those stem cells will regrow heart tissue. I'm showing you some schematics or sketches of what's called a catheter. That's the black tube. And the black tube is inserted into arteries along the silver wire. And there are stem cells that are injected through very small ports or holes, and those stem cells then get onto the artery wall and help regrow heart tissue. I was involved in developing the fluid dynamics of this catheter, and this catheter is now going through clinical trials to help regrow heart tissue. I think I have one more, a couple more images, Babani. There's two more. This is an, another sketch, and you can see here that when the device is inserted, a balloon is used, it's called an angioplasty balloon. It's used to open up the artery and press the artery walls backwards. So in the lower right image, you can see a large balloon. And in the lower right image, you can see a small diameter balloon. So we developed this device so that it can treat different sized arteries. That is, it's a one size fits all catheter. So this is another example of a device that we've worked on here that is now a actual product. Okay, Babani, I think we'll go to my last. My last example is related to drinking water. Unsafe water is one of the biggest health risks around the world. It's the number, it's the second biggest killer of children under five. Billions of people do not have access to clean drinking water. And I do a lot of work around the world, uh, especially in East Africa. And this is a problem that we got to learn about seven years ago. And so we formed a company and this company boils water with sunlight, boils water with sunlight. And then we sell the water and we create entrepreneurs who can then make a profit by taking dirty water, boiling it, and selling it to drink. And I'm gonna walk you, all of this, all of these products were designed here at St. Thomas. The one shown in the middle is a parabolic mirror that reflects sunlight onto a pipe. And it boils the water because of the concentrated sunlight. This parabolic mirror connects to an iPhone or a smartphone, it picks up the GPS location and the time, and then it knows where the sun is, and it tracks the sun during the day. So that centerpiece will move with the sun automatically. No one needs to touch it. If you go to the next slide, Babani, this is a solar PV panel that generates electricity, so people have electricity, but also runs the pumps so that we can pump the water. Next, this device has our electronics that communicates with the cell equipment, or I'm sorry, with the cell phone. The payments are all by mobile money. No, no hard currency is uh, exchanged. And in addition, the safe clean water is stored in a tank in that box. So people walk up with a jerry can and they have a chip on the jerry can that says they purchased water and then they fill their jerry can with water and leave. And they're charged uh, using uh, uh, electronic money. And the last, the last slide, the last image shows a storage tank. So I'm, uh, these storage tanks hold water in many parts of the world 
And if you drink the water right out of the storage tank, you might get sick. So we actually take these storage tanks filled with unsafe drinking water. We run it through our pasteurization system and then sell the water. So this is a system which was invented at my university. We formed a company and now we're starting to sell these worldwide. So I've given you four examples and these are examples from my research, but other faculty have similar research projects that would show the connection between our faculty, our students, and industry. And on the four research projects that I've shown, students were involved in every single one of them. In fact, one of our students is now the majority owner of this company, and they're now raising money through an investment round. So we like to teach theory, and we like to teach fundamentals, and we like to teach students applied research that they can use in their job or to start new businesses. We are an applied company or applied university and we're focused on transferable skills. And I think that's the end of my slide. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Dr. Misra. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got a couple photos. These are actually photographs of the real device in operation. We have one in Kenya, one in Uganda, and one in the United States. So this is one photograph of our device. And then this is another photograph of it being installed. So these are not devices on paper. These are real physical devices. And now I'll turn it back to you, Babani. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. So uh, coming back to one of the key, uh, key factors why we attract students is because, as uh, Dr. Ibrahim mentioned to you, of the applied nature. We teach theory, the underlying theory, we also teach how it can be applied and actually give the experience of doing something in the field. That is how our students many times are hired even before completion of their degree. But coming back to what our program is structured like, we, unlike most of the universities, they have what's called cohort programs. That means everybody who starts at a particular semester they kept the same courses, go semester by semester and finally graduate. We have designed it for convenience of individuals working in industry to come back and take these graduate level courses. We have what's called a non-cohort model. That means if I'm a student, I can decide which two courses I will take this semester, which two next semester and so on. And we do not have to march through the same set of courses for every student. Individually, the sequence of courses can be planned by individual to meet their requirement. But, but for each, of, uh, each and every course, there are certain required courses and certain elective courses. But the, it, the flexibility of uh, deciding how many courses, uh, of course, there is a limit of how many courses, two per semester, and then uh, in what order and what it is, is we leave it to this students in consultation with the advisors to make that happen. So that's what we, uh, we mean by non-cohort program. We try to uh, make such that the students, those who are full-time, they also work on campus uh, in research projects as well as other on-campus jobs. But those who are working in company and want, want to go through this program to enhance their career, we want to make it convenient for them. How we do that? We don't make them come every three times a week to our campus. We make them come once a week to attend a class and we hold the classes in the evenings. Our semesters are 14 weeks long. The summer classes are seven weeks long. Therefore, the summer classes meet twice a week instead of uh, once a week. We do support career changes, that means Let's say somebody had a physics major or somebody has some other area. We do look at closely how the individual can get into, let's say, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or similar thing, kind of thing. The other thing that our classrooms provide is because uh, more than half of our students, maybe 60, 70% of our students in a class could be somebody who is working for a company, maybe 3M or Boston Scientific, St. Jude's Medical or Medtronic or any of this local large and small companies, they come and take classes. 
when they come and take classes, the classroom environment is enriched because of their own professional experience they share in the classroom. It is, the classroom is just not one way delivery of a lecture, but it becomes much more enriched because of the experience from the professionals who you attend. That's how we even make our program more stronger to prepare our students to become an engineer in the real workforce. And then most of our industry, faculty have industry experience as well as experience of dealing with industry, doing industrial projects. Now a little bit about our faculty, as we said, our full-time faculty are tenured, have PhD degrees with industry experience or industry participation in their work. Uh, we also have a number of faculty, those who are working professionals. They come and teach a class in the evening and we select them very carefully based on their educational background as well as their experience. So there are several of those adjunct faculty maybe have a PhD degree but working in a company, but they come and teach our class. So that's how, how we do that. Our average class size is 23 actually. It is sometimes some of the classes are as small as seven, eight, 10, depending on which course it is. But we limit our class size. We say 35, but never gone beyond 30. We have a modern facilities, well-equipped lab. As you can see from Dr. Abraham's uh, uh, discussion, there are several things that we do and those are supported in many of our labs. We have labs open extended hours. And the way the classes are held, it is lecture, discussions, case study, term paper, homework, reading. It's like any other university, but on a more individual student participation is given a lot of weightage. It is just not just listening to the lecture and prepare for the final exam. It has to be all the time being part of the class and learning things. Average student, uh, the age range of our students goes from 22 to 64. This may surprise some of you because in India, people don't go to school after certain age, but United States is different. It is, education is not limited to any age or any particular thing. People come to um, college to study and get their master's degree or other advanced degree, even at later stage in life. The average student age uh, is 32. We have about 26% uh, students, female students. We have 32% people of color, about 14% international students in the engineering program. But overall graduate programs, both engineering and software together is about 35%. So we have a large population of, so that's what we have. Hey, hey Babani, could I interject oh, yeah. something? Sure. Um, I just wanna tell people uh, that are listening that the University of St. Thomas it, our, and our whole community has open arms for a diverse students. We love international students and we love students from other places. We really, our university becomes better when we have people attending from around the world because it gives a richer experience for everyone. And if you are in a classroom at St. Thomas, you may have someone from South America, you may have someone from Europe, you'll have someone from uh, Far Asia, uh, East Asia, you'll have someone from the Middle East. We think it is a real advantage to have a very diverse uh, student population. We treasure it, we cherish it, and we hope that we've created an, an inviting atmosphere for students of all kind to participate. I just wanted to add that. No, thank you, thank you, exactly. That is that is how our classrooms look like. It is more of a global environment than one specific uh, country or specific uh, kind of students. That is one thing we pride about, and that's one thing great about our university. It's It, it kind of, helps our student to be exposed what the rest of the world looks like and the global experience one gets in the classroom itself. So this shows that we have a large population of international students in engineering and software, graduate programs in School of Engineering. Then we also have what is called career development support. This is a free service to all our students as well as all our alumni. We have a career development center which provides career planning, counseling, resume, cover letter, job internship search tools. 
interview skills, evaluating, and so on. But the most important thing is this career development center also has a website where companies come and self-serve by posting their jobs so that our students can connect. In addition to that, we are approached by the local companies every now and then directly or through our faculty, the job opportunities that they are looking for. And we, whenever we have such information, we pass it on to our students so that our students can get into the workforce quickly. This is a picture showing the companies that exist here in Twin Cities. And these are the companies from where we get students and where our students after graduation go and work, even before graduation as interns. The application process is very simple. We require a bachelor's degree with a GPA of 2.7. We do not require GRE or GMAT anymore. We used to, but we did not find any correlation because of the kind of program that we have. The process is very simple, going online and applying, uploading resume, paying an application fee, and then we need official undergraduate and graduate transcripts from each and every applicant. We, in addition to that, for all international students, we require what's called English proficiency. Our requirement for TOEFL score is 80, and ILTS is 6.5. We do have um, an international student questionnaire, which every international student fills up, and we need a financial certification to issue the I-20, uh, the form by which one can get the student visa to come to the United States to study. We do have what's called rolling admissions. That means we, any time one can apply and can get admitted. We have certain priority dates. What that priority date means, those are the deadlines by which one should apply. But if there is a slight variation to this, a slight delay, we do accommodate. And let us know that's what we always say. So, uh, and at the same time, it takes about three to five weeks for us to process completed applications. So only after everything has been submitted and completed, it takes three to four, three, four weeks for getting back to our students, uh, prospective students with the decision. The cost for the tuition uh, this year is $1173.50 per credit, that each class is three credits, which means it comes to $3,500. In addition to this tuition, we do have what's called technology fee, that's a, uh, amount that is paid for all the different technology services that we have. And it's $58 for semester per six, less than six credits and $116.50 for semester for six or more credits. The application fee is $50. The other thing in summary, when you are making a decision where to study, we, we are the kind of university the, we are more, it's not pure theoretical research, we are more applied research. And we are preparing students to be useful in the profession. That's what is the most important thing we try to emphasize. And that is what our employers like about us, that's what our students like about us. They are, and that is one thing, as you are looking at different universities, assess where the job market is good, where the job opportunities are good. The city with many companies, the people are um, finding jobs, that's what is important. Second thing is the cost of education. When you compare uh, which university, the cost of education is, uh, uh, the overall cost of education is reflected in I-20 form. And in our website, international website, we, there is an exact number what one has to show in I-20 which I believe is about $27,000 per year. If you compare that with other universities, it is um, generally much higher than for a similar type of education. The other th thing is it may or may not be required to spend that kind of money depending on, because our cost of living comparatively, let's say um, somebody coming to a major city like New York, uh, uh, San Francisco and all that, the cost of living there is much higher than a place like this and with a lot of job opportunities. So that is what, and the university provides a way of getting into job market quickly. So the curriculum 
is current and relevant. That's what we do. We have what's called comprehensive curriculum for our things. And then a little bit about international students. As you probably know, or the, idea, the United States government allows every international student to work on campus up to 20 hours per week. So which means on arrival on campus, we always encourage our international students to look for a job on campus because officially and legally they're allowed to work up to 20 hours. Now, after two semesters, international students are in, can get what is called curricular practical training, which means they can work up to 20 hours per week in a company at, uh, and or during the summer months, that is June, July, August, they can work up to 40 hours with curricular practical training, CPT. Then soon after their graduation, they have what's called a permit to work for one year. And then because all our programs are STEM, the, with E-Verify employers, that can be extended two more years. So that means the, uh, one can work from the day arrives in, on campus, then work on, in the company after two semesters, work for three more years in a company on OPT. And one thing I always, whenever I meet with any new international students, the first thing I encourage them is to go and find a job on campus. And the reason is, unlike India, in the United States, everybody starts working in some kind of job right from high school days and college days. <clears throat> in that process, everyone has built up their references. If an international student comes here and applies for a job directed to a company after two semesters, the first thing they will ask, what is your reference? Who, do we, who can vouch for you that you did a good job? So that is where university job to start with helps our international students. That's why I encourage everybody not just to focus on studies, but also start working. And work inside the university can be many different things including working with our faculty member on their research projects, working in our computer labs or computer in our um, engineering labs. So those are the things available to our students. <clears throat> so now what are the next steps? You can go ahead and apply online, upload your resume. The admission essay is not required for engineering, English proficiency score, and a financial certification for I-20. And these are the uh, contact information, grad engineering at stthomas.edu is your best way to connect with us. Any questions, anything with respect to um, going through the process if you want to. And then there is this stthomas.edu slash engineering slash graduate, which I can uh, just show you for a second uh, that way. Here. So if you go to St. Thomas, the video, are you able to see this? Uh, no, it's not. So if you type um, St. Thomas GDU slash engineering, it will bring us to our School of Engineering program. And if you go into graduate, there is all these different master's degrees are here. And if you want to look at mechanical engineering, it will show you the mechanical engineering details. And then apply for admission is right here. And then there is also a place uh, where it talks about international students for in information session and then so the basic thing is um, a number of information is there just by going to this website that's what i wanted to show you that uh, this is where you can uh, get most of the information but most important thing is to 
connect us through this uh, email address, send us an email. We will be happy to answer. This phone number is, uh, of course, uh, phone number here in our office, and this is the website. Those are the uh, two ways how you can connect with us. So, and there's no question um, is, uh, I mean, any question comes to your mind, please feel free to ask us. With that, I will move to this space where Gen Next information is also there through whom you can connect with us as well. So with that, I would uh, now request um, Sandeep, you want to talk uh, about your experience at University of St. Thomas Mechanical Engineering Program. Sure, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. I just wanted to answer John's question earlier uh, with regard to icing in the winter. I'm no, sorry, fishing in the winter. And yes, it was. I actually did uh, last to last winter, and it was amazing for the first time when you stand on a frozen lake and not feeling worried about getting the ice broken. So it was thick enough to hold my weight. And uh, yeah, I think I also did uh, skiing. I learned skiing, so those are some of the things that I think I did in winter. So back to everyone. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Sandeep, and I completed my undergraduate in mechanical engineering in 2016. It sounds long time back, but still. And after that, I worked for uh, two years as an engineer in mechanical stream, and after that i decided i want to do a master so i started uh, like you all like searching out universities and things like that and i think i attended one of uh, their sessions in one of the educational institution and i was impressed by their course the way they offer and things like that and uh, from that day on i constantly during my admission i constantly texted one of the person involved and they were uh, very much helpful and they just reply immediately. And uh, over the course of time, it has become like, hey, this is a very good school at the time of applying. And uh, some of the real, I didn't know where Minneapolis was, just like uh, Mr. mentioned before. And uh, I was like, where is this? And many people, and I told them like, hey, I'm thinking of going to Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, they were like, oh no, it, uh, it is a cold place, are you sure? And I was like, I have never seen snow or winter, so why not? And after that, uh, it was a very, very, very good experience so far. And I would say these are some of the reasons why St. Thomas stands uh, apart from other universities. So one as one being the cost, since cost is very important from a student perspective, uh, I think you can finish a master's less than 40,000 overall. And when you compare with other universities, you, you will be end up paying at least 50,000 a year for one year, rather than here you are finishing your entire master's under 40,000. And the second reason being the campus location. You have many companies, and I was fortunate enough to get to work in a company as a, both in manufacturing and medical device. And manufacturing, I was interning with the company. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was interning with the company for the summer, and uh, I worked there for four months, and uh, I learned a lot of things from them. And after that, uh, the other thing was I was working in a like a regional research and development engineer in a startup company for a medical device. And it is a totally a very good thing because it has opened many things. And uh, the curriculum is set in such a way that, you know, you can uh, work and study, which is possible, which I did. And the classes are structured in such a way that it will be helpful for you in both your coursework and your work, so professional work. And uh, I, I think uh, the connections that you make in class, like I had people from who works in you know, Medtronic or Boston Scientific 
or any other startup company these are some of the links that you get while attending the class and it is easy for you to get in if you know at least someone uh, so you can be like hey i know you have we have been in this class and uh, i'm i'm looking to apply for this job can you refer me and most of the time we'll be very happy to refer you and uh, that's much easier when compared to you don't know anyone and uh, trying to apply to a company and uh, the cost of living the i think the cost of living is very affordable here and uh, i know some of you are like what is about the on campus job and uh, managing i think uh, it, you can manage from your on campus job for living here and uh, i think i worked three different places in campus i was started from i think i started at one of their uh, service centers and then i worked with their ideas and currently i'm working with the registrar as a graduate assistant so i have been in multiple roles and uh, when i joined i didn't think i i was not very much into uh, medical devices i was thinking for manufacturing but after taking a couple of courses and uh, talking with uh, john and other professors i think i learned i learned that i love making medical devices and the work experience which i gained is much more valuable and uh, to sum it up uh, st thomas is a great place and everyone here have uh, treat you like an extended family member and help you out if you have any questions you can talk to any one of them at any point of time and uh, they will always give you the best thank you thank you sandeep thank you john shila you would we have any questions uh, absolutely there are a couple of questions from students and thank you very much for that um so our first question for the day is um our job opportunities for international students who have graduated from mechanical engineering stream limited i i would say in the in the job in a in a place like uh, twin cities minnesota the number of companies are so many and then the overall job market for technical field is still a shortage so specifically for a particular student in mechanical engineering i i think the job market is pretty good but i cannot exactly say how many and who it is but the general feeling for any engineers or anybody in the technical field the stem field the job market in twin cities and specifically in uh, specifically twin cities in the, and the state of minnesota is extremely good am i correct uh, uh, john uh, babani and sandeep uh, what are the allowances for international students to work students can work while they're studying and then mm -hmm. i think they get like 2 years maybe after they graduate to continue working without any green card or anything uh, sandeep maybe you know more about this process yeah i think well, you, i just mentioned as i mentioned they can work 20 hours on campus while they are students after two semesters they are allowed to work off campus 20 hours per week and 40 hours during summer months and after finishing the degree they can work one year practical training is given right away and that can be extended by two more years so that means three years after graduation and while being a student one can also work anything you want to add sandeep well i think after completing the first year i think they can work on cpt for uh, for a year and uh, after that once they graduate they have yeah, plus two years yeah um, this yeah no, cpt you know, worked with a couple of students uh, if you could just give a few examples as to where where your students are currently working who have graduated from mechanical engineering stream do you have any examples that you could quote or we can always answer that later too uh, 
Go ahead, Professor. No, you go ahead. I don't know the answer. Uh, the exact students in mechanical engineering. Well, uh, I have known uh, one graduate who I met uh, in by chance when I was uh, was working in the registrar. He was working for a manufacturing company. Uh, I think it was more like a startup, and he was working full time. And I think he was in his second year of OPT. Uh, I don't exactly remember the company name, but he was working for a manufacturing company in located in Minnesota. My my understanding is many of the students do get jobs through the connection in the classroom, through the post job postings that we receive, but they don't come and tell us where we got they got hired. That's why um, we we do not specifically ask that question, nor they come back and tell us. But uh, we not heard anybody coming back and saying, "Oh, I I'm still looking." From I, so I cannot say for sure what exactly. Is a status, but my impression um, is they do get jobs, and um, if not, they would have come and asked us or something. But uh, we do not track that because what happens is, I would say, 60, 70 percent of our students are already working in companies. These international students and other those who are not working are full-time international students. For them, they are the one who is looking for jobs, and most of them get it. That's my, but one thing I have asked our international students office for how many people get CPT and OPT. CPT is a curricular practical training and optional practical training. According to the conversation I had with the international students office, almost all our students, specifically in the in School of Engineering graduate programs, get CPT, that means they're just getting jobs while in the program, and OPT afterwards. So that is the number I can say from the international students office that yes, most of them have been hired by somebody. Fantastic. Um, our next question, um, I know part of this question has been answered, but I'm just gonna read out the question to you. What is the measurement of success with this degree? What does research look like? Is there a thesis and non-thesis option available for the stream? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first. Really good questions. Uh, we offer two different uh, plans for our master's program. You can do the master's uh, program just taking courses. And that would be, at least in the mechanical engineering program, which I'm the program director for, that would be 10 courses. Alternatively, you can take the project option, which is similar to a thesis. The project counts as two courses. So if you take the project option, you'd end up enrolling in eight courses and take a project. So either 10 courses or eight courses plus a project. And we treat the project like a thesis, but we don't technically call it a thesis because master's theses are open to the literature. They're open to the public. And many times people do their project on a company's uh, research project and companies do not want their products shown to the public. So uh, if you do that, you may violate patent rules, intellectual property rules and so forth. So we do have these two tracks, a project track and a course track. And, and students can choose which one to do, but you don't have to choose right away. And in fact, you can change your mind. So let me give you an example. Sometimes students will come planning to do the 10 courses, but they might start working for a company. And the company says, hey, we're working on this project. Could you study this in more detail? And the student will turn that into a master's project. So they'll be paid while they're getting their degree, which is a great deal. And in that case, a student may switch from the course option to the project option. So you can switch, that happens all the time, but there are two, pro there are two different options for our masters in mechanical engineering. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, our next question is scholarship-based. Uh, what are financial aid? 
what types of awards are available, teaching assistantship, research assistantships or fellowships? We, the, the answer is we provide on campus uh, job opportunities. We do not have, depending on students, a faculty member may hire that particular student to work on certain research project. That could be, again, a kind of cam on campus job. That's what we have. We have done two things. We have kept our tuition relatively low to be affordable at the same time. So that means we, we do not charge a lot of tuition and then give scholarship. We have made our tuition lower. The second thing is we do have a lot of opportunities on campus for people to earn while they're studying. So we do not we do not call it a scholarship or assistance, but we have an indirect way of helping our students with finances to go through the program. Thank you, Dr. Bhavani. Uh, Sandeep, this is a question for you. What is the student community like? Do many of you work in addition to taking classes and conducting research? Uh, well, yes. Uh, after the first year, uh, I worked for a company as an intern and was able to study at the same time. I was able to balance both of the things. And during first year, during my year one, I was only working on on-campus job and studying. So you can do both. And in fact, because our courses are at night, there's, each course is three hours at night once a week. Your days are open. And most of our students work during the day and then they come take it, these night classes. So we set up our courses so that they allow you to work during the day, which helps make this happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, again, I think this question is for Sandeep again. Uh, what do you think of the graduate program generally and specifically? What are the pros and cons you have discovered being in this program? Well, uh, the pros of this programs are like, uh, as Dr. John and Ms. Ram mentioned, it is in the evening. So you have pretty much the entire morning with you. And especially if you're working somewhere and you have enough time for you to work uh, and then even concentrate. And we meet only twice a week. So you'll be taking two courses. So you'll be meeting in the evenings and you have sufficient time to catch up with the coursework, let's say an assignment or an exam you'll be able to concentrate on that as well as if you're working, you can work uh, the full time as in your second year and uh, you can try to balance both. Thank you. Um, Dr. John, uh, this is a question for you. Are students <clears throat> expected to be involved in research during the first year of study and uh, what kind of electives can students take? Really great question, thanks. Thank you for asking that. So our programs are set up so that there are some courses in mandatory areas and then there are some free electives. So let me explain that a little more. If you go into the Masters of Mechanical Engineering, you would take one course in manufacturing, one in materials, one in simulation, one in power, one in thermal, and then there's one other area. So there's six courses. Now in each, each of those courses, there's a pool that you can choose from. So for example, in materials, in the materials area, there's maybe four or five courses, you pick one. In manufacturing, there's maybe four or five courses, you pick one. And once you take a course in that area, you've satisfied that area. In addition to those six courses in themed areas, there are four free electives, that's anything. You could take anything. You could take, let's say you really like manufacturing. You could take four more manufacturing courses if you want to become an expert. Let's say you really like medical devices. You could take four electives in medical devices or you could take one elective here, one elective here, one elective here, spread them out, you choose. But you have four free electives and then you have some themed areas that you have to choose from. So that's how the course is set up. If you come in and let's say you have strong. We lost you, John. Tell me, hey, John. It's fine. 
I, I allow you to take an extra elective instead of a new materials course. So we're flexible depending on your background and what you hope to do with your career. With respect to research, no one is mandated to do research. The majority of our students are working during the day to earn money and then they take courses at night and they don't do research with a faculty. The majority of our students don't do research. But when you're working for a company during the day, you are doing research at your company anyway. So there's no mandatory research. Thank you, Dr. John. Um, I know Dr. Babani would love to answer the next question that I'm going to ask now. Uh, would the new uh, rules of immigration and customs enforcement on F1 visa affect fall 2021 applicants? Uh, I, as far as students' admission is concerned, I, that's not going to be affected, number one. Number two, what it will be with respect to getting the visa to enter the country, it will depend on when the U.S. consulates throughout the world open up. To the best of my knowledge, they're closed at this time. So that is what we'll basically decide. And fall 2021 looks reasonably uh, okay at this point. Even the spring 2021 is also uh, possibly okay. So um, fall 2020 is difficult at this point because throughout the world, excepting one or two consulates are opening up, I understand, in Middle East and something maybe opening up in China in the next couple of weeks, but otherwise rest of the world, US consulates are closed and they have backlog of visa requests. So I don't have a strong feeling that people will get student visa for fall 2020, but 2021 looks very good at this point. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, our next question, are there any situations that you have uh, noticed when students leave the program uh, much earlier than their completion before they can graduate? The, I've not heard of such happening. Um, I'm not aware of that. Same here. I have not heard people just drop and run and go away. No. Um, what kind of professional development program do graduate students receive at University of St. Thomas? We, we prepare individuals to be ready for the profession. So I think each and everything that we do is for professional growth of individuals. So every course, yeah, every exposure. I'm sorry, John. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, our courses are designed to enable you to advance your career. That's the whole purpose of coming here. You want to get a job or get a better job in your profession. Now, sometimes professional development refers to things like how to do job searches, how to write a resume, how to write a cover letter, how to do interviews. And we have a office on campus that will help you with that. But as Sandeep said earlier, and I've, as Dr. Mister said earlier, we often get companies that call us and say, hey, I need a person to fill this job. And we actually place our students directly. So you have two resources with respect to professional development. I'm talking about development outside of the technology. You have the on-campus office that can help you do things like write a resume and a cover letter and find job postings. And then you have your faculty advisor who does the same thing. I edit resumes all the time. I help students find jobs all the time. So in addition to our in-course instruction, it teaches you to become a qualified engineer. We do have these outside of the classroom professional development opportunities. And uh, Dr. John, can the elective subject of course that a student um, takes be different from the mechanical stream or it should be something to do with the stream that a student has chosen? No, they can be different. So for example, we have a master's in electrical engineering. You can absolutely take a course from that program and it will count as an elective in our mechanical program. We have software development. I've even counted some business courses like uh, financial planning and, and uh, accounting. Uh, we have courses in our law program related to patent law. Those are very important courses 
I mean, many times uh, engineers invent something, they think they're very smart, they build a product, and then they, later they discover it's already been patented. That's a disaster. We wanna make sure that doesn't happen with our students. So we offer a wide latitude of courses. I would say this right now, any course in the School of Engineering, and you know it's a School of Engineering course because it has the letters E-T-L-S, E-T-L-S, any course E-T-L-S, we would count. And if you want courses outside of engineering, just come and make a case. But we've allowed courses outside of engineering. You absolutely do not have to take every course in your, design, in your selected program. Um, and that is quite true. We do, in fact, as a normal practice, allow at least two courses from other parts of the university, law school, business school, as well as software development, data science. If somebody is a mechanical engineering student, has the flexibility of doing it and vice versa. Other students also have. We as a university do not limit or restrict somebody just for mechanical engineering means only mechanical engineering. The students are allowed from different areas to take it. But in as uh, Dr. Ibrahim just said, but we would like to know why somebody is doing something. So that's why we need to have that conversation to make sure that somewhat aligns with it. It should not be totally out of alignment from the mechanical engineering, but we encourage individuals to take outside. Sandeep, what courses did you take? Uh, can, you, can you talk about the, t the courses that you take for your degree and include the electives that you selected, if you can remember them? You are muted. Oops, sorry. So if I'm not wrong, uh, the courses I have taken so far, one is from electrical, uh, which is renewable energy. And one was with John, uh, which was thermal. Uh, it was with, uh, and uh, I took a majority in uh, materials, uh, which includes material engineering, uh, polymers, uh, polymers, and uh, uh, advanced development in materials, and then uh, medical device with regard to, I have taken two courses, uh, which is medical device and regulation and uh, advanced, uh, uh, John, what is uh, ETLS 555? Five, five, five? Uh, ETLS 555 five, five is our advanced product design course. Yes. That's where students are taught how to develop a product, including developing customer specifications, how to understand what the customer needs, pick materials and so forth. Uh, maybe even how to finance a company, but I don't know uh, the I, details um, as well. Well, yes, that is one of the courses which I've taken. And uh, I think that counts roughly nine courses so far. And in the fall, I'm planning to take, uh, what is that? Um, one is with regard to manufacturing and one more is with regard to medical device. Uh, Sandeep, I want to ask a follow-up question. How did you decide on your electives? Did you just find things that fit days that you were open or did you find things that fit what you wanted to do in your career? How did you make that decision? Well, I think the first time was with you, John. Uh, we had a quick chat in your office and you just gave me the brief like hey these are the six core elements that we need to take it off and uh, at that time i was like uh, you asked me which area are you concentrated on and i was blank if i'm not wrong and you were like hey there is materials and there is medical device if you're interested in any one of these concentrate on that so i think i divided that into two so I think if I'm not wrong, I've taken everything in materials, which is offered, and uh, which are three courses, and uh, uh, medical device as of now, two. So you can chat with John. Uh, and stop. Is it? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Should I go on to the next question? Yes. Sure, I think that's, that's uh, about the brief. 
I know there were a lot of questions on courses. So there's one more question. Uh, are there any courses rather than masters for an undergrad student who's coming from India who doesn't want to take masters, but are there any short term courses that a student can apply to and uh, enroll at probably a one year course or a six month course? I think that's the question, but I'm just um, elaborating that and asking you about. We do have those graduate certificates, which can be done in a year. Those generally have four courses. Then as, as we have said, it's not just mechanical engineering. We as a graduate program in School of Engineering, we have 10 different areas, 10 different degrees we have. So we do have um, other areas in the area of data science or software or electrical, we have several electrical certificates we have. We, so one can, we have a wide range of choices or options one can choose from. And if there is a specific individual have a specific questions, I would like to talk to him to understand his needs and may be able to um, discuss and come up with a specific plan for that particular individual or individuals, those who are looking for such a thing. Uh, what are the real world applications of work done at the university? I think this question relates to research work. Uh, I, that's how I'm interpreting it. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. Uh, but our faculty work uh, in a number of different areas, but it's all driven by companies. So companies come to our university and they provide uh, research opportunities for our faculty and student to work on projects that the company is doing. So I, I'll give my, I gave four examples of what I'm working on earlier. Uh, other faculty are working on rapid prototyping technologies, microgrid technologies, uh, civil engineering projects. Um, I also do a lot of uh, water uh, quality control um, you know, how do you control water distribution for agriculture and with dams and, and different types of water control structures. So it's really a wide range of technical applications that our faculty are working on, mostly driven by uh, U.S. or international companies. So um, that was our last question. And I think with that, we have come to the end of this session. But before uh, that, I just wanted to ask if any one of you have any last minute um, tips to give to our students here. I would say, please do not hesitate to contact us directly or through Gen Next. We'll be happy to answer any questions and we'll be able to hopefully help to go through the process of understanding us better and taking the right direction um, and taking the right decision, I mean. So that's what I would suggest. And then another thing I would uh, encourage each and every participant to share this information that such a university with this kind of capability and things are happening, they, to share with your friends and colleagues who can also benefit from something like this. That's what I would say. And again, I'll repeat, do not hesitate to contact us directly or through Gen Next, and we would like to hear from you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Babani, Dr. Abraham, and Sandeep for providing such valuable insights and answering all of our students' questions. It was absolutely delightful to have you on our panel today and address our uh, Chitkara students. Um, just so you, uh, I mean, just to let you know, our association with Chitkara University goes back a long way. It's been very productive association and Gen Next team looks forward to much, uh, such fruitful ventures and collaboration with uh, Chitkara University. Uh, so thank you once again. And to all of our participants on the webinar, please register on our portal, um, www.imfutureready.com if you haven't done it already. And uh, we have an excellent, well-informed uh, team on ground uh, who will guide you through and help you achieve your dream of studying abroad, uh, all free of cost. You can email us at uh, future at genxeducation.com, mark us as your safe sender, and please save our WhatsApp number, which is on the screen, um, as you will receive important updates from us. 
So thank you once again for joining us on this webinar and stay tuned for more information from us regarding upcoming webinars. I would like to just add one more sentence is I just want to thank Sanjeev Sani. I think he must have been the key person behind all making this happen. I just want to thank him and thank everybody in the Chitkara University team for making this happen as well. And also thank you, Jen Next, for helping us out. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.